speaking about Japan, in Japan, is always a big challenge for an outsider. And what I'll be offering you is an outsider's perspective on Japan's security challenges. What I intend to do is to offer a broad geostrategic overview of Japan's security dilemma and its possible options. When viewed against the prism of history, Japan's political rise should not come as a surprise. With its martial traditions, Japan historically has punched far above its weight, a record punctured only by its World War II defeat and occupation by the US. In the post-war period, Japan has long been used to practicing passive checkbook diplomacy. As you know, it's become famous since the early 1990s. If there's an international crisis, Japan writes a check running into billions of dollars. Even though this passive checkbook diplomacy to some extent continues to this day, there is new sign of Japan's intent to influence Asia's emerging balance of power. And while Japan has been content for decades to let the United States of America take care of its security, it can no longer afford to be so content. After all, America's Asian allies and strategic partners have received three jarring wake-up calls in the last three years. The first wake-up call came in the form of President Obama's complete silence when China in 2012 captured the disputed Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines. This shoal is located within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. The capture happened despite a U.S. brokered agreement under which both the Chinese and Philippine vessels were to withdraw from the area. The Philippine vessels withdrew, but China reinforced its naval presence in that area and captured the shoal. Obama's apparent indifference to America's commitment to the Philippines under their mutual defense treaty only emboldened China to up their ante in the South China Sea. As a result, we have seen these activities relating to land reclamation and building of outposts on the reefs and islands in the South China Sea. America's Asian allies received a second wake-up call when China in 2013 unilaterally established an air defense identification zone. This ADIZ, as it is called, covers territories in the East China Sea that China claims but does not control. This sets a very dangerous precedent in international relations. A country establishes an air zone that extends to territories it covets but does not control. Instead of demonstrating American disapproval of China's unilateral action, the United States did the opposite. For example, Vice President Joe Biden was scheduled to visit Beijing. The US did not 
cancel or even postpone Joe Biden's Beijing visit. And just after Japan advised its airlines to ignore China's new ADIZ, the US government ordered American carriers to respect this new air zone. And by calling for Japanese restraint in the face of China's unilateral action, the US only stoked Japanese anxiety. Now, China has begun enforcing its ADIZ in the East China Sea. The third wake-up call came from the Ukraine issue. The Obama administration responded to Russia's annexation of Crimea by distancing the US from the Budapest Memorandum. The Budapest Memorandum is the pact President Bill Clinton signed in 1994, pledging to uphold Ukraine's territorial integrity in return, in return for Ukraine giving up its nuclear arsenal. The first two wake-up calls highlighted the Obama administration's unwillingness to do anything that could disrupt America's close ties with China, which has become central to US interests. The first and third wake-up calls showed that America's own vital interests must directly be at stake for it to come to the military aid of another country, including a country with which it has a mutual defense treaty or a defense agreement. The paradox is that Asian anxiety over China's growing assertiveness has helped the United States to return to the center stage of Asian geopolitics and to strengthen and expand its security arrangements in Asia. Yet, the Obama administration has addressed its calls for restraint, not just to China, but also to its allies and strategic partners in Asia. Obama's pivot to Asia remains more rhetorical than real. In fact, as part of a course correction, even the name has been changed from pivot to rebalancing. In this light, an important question arises. Can Japanese policymakers feel confident that the US will come to Japan's aid militarily in the event of a Chinese invasion of the Japanese-controlled Senkaku Islands? The Obama administration's contradictory rhetoric, on the one hand affirming that the Sankakus are covered by the US-Japan Security Treaty, and on the other hand, not taking a position on the sovereignty of these islands, this contradictory stance has not helped. Make no mistake, in the East and South China Seas, what is at stake, what is at stake are not just some tiny islands, reefs, or rocks. What is at stake is a rules-based regional order, freedom of navigation of the seas and skies, access to maritime resources, in the global commons, and balanced power dynamics in Asia. From distant United States or distant Europe, the disputes might be seen as disputes over rocks. But in reality, what is at stake 
is the very future direction of Asia and its security. Against this background, America's Asian allies and strategic partners are being forced to accept that they will have to contend with Chinese military incursions mainly on their own. This is why they are stepping up efforts to build credible military capabilities. More fundamentally, the security challenges that Japan faces today raise questions about the continued efficacy of the arrangements made after World War II. The new geopolitical realities in Asia demand that the United States go beyond its Cold War era hub and spoke security system, the spokes being the allies in a patron-client framework. The hub and spoke security system is more suited to keep Japan as an American protectorate than to allow Japan to more effectively contribute to the central US policy objective in the Asian theater. What is the central US policy objective in the Asian theater? A stable balance of power. Only Japan can forestall the rise of a Sinocentric East Asia. America's Japan policy is crying for revision. After all, US interests will be better served by a more capable Japan that's able to ensure regional peace. A subtle US policy shift that encourages Tokyo to cut its overdependence on the United States and do more for its own security can go a long way in ensuring power equilibrium in Asia. Such a policy shift is likely to be dictated by the US imperative to make substantial cuts in defense expenditure so that the United States can focus attention on comprehensive domestic renewal, comprehensive domestic renewal so as to arrest the decline, the erosion in its relative power. If the United States is to rely less on pre-positioned forward deployments of its forces and act more as an offshore balancer, it will have to make fundamental changes in its post-1945 security system. Japan, too, needs to make fundamental reforms in its national security policies. Japan must secure itself against dangers that did not exist when the existing national security policies and laws were framed. One example of Japan's security dilemma is to act like an important power and be able to defend itself with its own means while still being deferential to US interests and being dependent on American security. The security challenges have prompted the present government, led by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, to try and normalize Japan's security posture, including through some of the recent moves, such as asserting the right to exercise collective self-defense, relaxing the long-standing self-imposed ban of Japan on export of arms, and instituting a security review. It's important to note 
that the United Nations Charter regards individual and collective self-defense as the inherent right, as the inherent right of all nations. It is a moot question whether these recent national security moves signal Japan's intent to break out of its post-war pacifist cocoon. These moves certainly will facilitate Japan's cooperation with friendly countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including building military collaboration that helps to reinforce Japan's own security and bolsters an Asian order that is under increasing challenge. The reality today is that new geopolitical developments and threats risk eroding Japan's security. Japan's pacifist policy under a US military umbrella no longer seems adequate to protect Japanese interests or even American interests. In Japan, national security reforms and constitutional reform from a legal standpoint are linked. But there's one issue that can make a meaningful difference to the constitutional revision and national security reforms in this country. That one factor is American support. American support can help assuage many Japanese that national security and constitutional reform would not mean repudiating the post-war order that America established in Japan or abandoning Japan's pacifist policies. U.S. security interests would be better served by a more confident and a more secure Japan that assumes greater responsibility for its own defense and for regional security. In the way the U.S. backed the Abe government's recent assertion of the right to exercise collective self-defense, in a similar manner, it ought to it ought to support broader national security reforms in this country. Looking ahead, and I'm coming to the concluding part of my presentation. Looking ahead, Japan, with the world's third largest economy, a world-class Navy, and impressive high-tech capabilities, is likely to remain a strong nation despite being eclipsed by the rapid rise of China. But can proactive pacifism help resolve Japan's security dilemma? Or does the dilemma demand that Japan become an independent military power like Britain and France, two of America's closest allies? Britain and France, despite being America's closest allies, have not entrusted their security to the US. Rather, they have built formidable military deterrent capabilities. The fact is that whatever steps Japan takes to bolster its security, to resolve its security dilemma, will carry profound implications for regional and international security. For example, if Japan decides to become an independent military power like Britain and France, it will be a game-changing development for Asia, the US, and the rest of the world. However, however, if Japan fails to adapt its post-war policies and laws to the new geopolitical realities of today, 
If it fails to do that, it could create a power vacuum that invites conflict. In the coming years, my prediction is that Japan will play an active role in shaping the evolving balance of power in Asia. It will do this by adapting its post-war institutions and policies to meet the new challenges. A Japan that is better able to defend itself and to partner with friendly Indo-Pacific countries will be able to forestall the emergence of a dangerous power imbalance in Asia. By playing such a role, Japan would truly become a proactive contributor to peace. Through its determination to reinvent itself, through its determination to reinvent, reinvent itself as a more competitive and secure nation, Japan is poised to enter a new era, an era in which it will strive to take its rightful place in the world. Thank you.